I want you to take a look at your screen. I have some words up there I want you to read. It says the word of God is divinely inspired, an instrument by which we are changed. We are to learn it, obey it, and claim its promises. I want you to say that with me before we begin, because that's what we're about to do tonight. It's, it's the word of God. We're going to study the word. Come on, say this with me. We'll say it together. The word of God is divinely inspired, an instrument by which we are changed. We are to learn it, obey it, and claim its promises. Once you start saying that in the morning, get that into your memory. That is actually our declaration for our church. Make it your declaration for yourself. Amen. Got an excellent lesson for you. Want you to open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 2, starting at verses 14. And hopefully, we'll get to 41. And um, this was the sermon by the Apostle Peter. If you think about it, it was the first sermon that was preached to the church outside of Jesus teaching the word of God. It was the first sermon. Peter was the apostle who was used by God to bring about the first sermon to be preached to the church. And so sermons are at times to be examined and to see what God is speaking through his vessel. And so this is a wonderful um, message that God uses Peter to present uh, to the church, the birth of the church, when the church was um, poured out of spirit, the, the last days, all of those things. So let's do this. Let's pray and then we'll get into it and we'll um, word by word, scripture by scripture, all the way to hopefully we can get to verses uh, 40, uh, 41. Amen. Well, let's pray. Well, once again, Father, in the blessed name of Jesus, we, uh, we thank you today. Each and every one of us, oh God, um, we're in different places with different challenges, but we're brothers and sisters in, in you, Lord. And Father, I thank you for the blood that covers us all. And I thank you for the sacrifice that you gave for all of us. Father, I pray for each and every person, circumstance, situation, and place where they are in. Oh, hallelujah. May me, I pray for their faith. That above all, Lord God, regardless of what we are facing, that they believe you, that they trust you. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And then, Father, most of all, that they understand and know that, that you love us beyond the shadow of a doubt, oh God. Oh, hallelujah. You are for us. You are not against us. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, Father, help us get that in our minds and our hearts, and let that be a part of our faith, that regardless to what we go through, regardless to what evil or wrong we face, you are for us. And you declare to us that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Now, fathers, we come to your table, your word, your bread of life to eat. I pray that you would feed our spirits, strengthen our faith. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. So the apostle Peter addresses, he makes a divine, um, he addresses a divine moment of God. It is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I love it because um, Peter stands up in the midst of the 11, he raises his voice and he says to the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. Oh, I love that. Um, if you have ever read this part of scripture, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was marked. Um, in verse 15, he says, for these are not drunk. They say, well, these men are drunk. They were speaking um, in different languages. There was 120 people in the upper room and the Holy Spirit was poured out and they were speaking in all these different languages from all these different countrymen and their tribes 
and they were speaking the things of God, and some of them did not understand what was going on. So they declared and said that they are drunk. So now their faith was ridiculed, and they tried to dismiss it. But Peter, come on, would say, no, these men are not drunk. And he went on to say, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, God will pour out his spirit. And I love it. I want to say this, too. While we're, while we're talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a lot of times this is really overlooked. People who get filled with the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to say this uh, to both, those of you that have been filled with the Spirit and those of you who have not been filled with the Spirit, people who have been filled with the Spirit, moved by the Spirit, had some kind of encounter with God, always seem to be ridiculed uh, from somebody because they don't understand or they don't have or have not experienced the Spirit of God. If you haven't experienced the Spirit of God, be careful. You don't want to really ridicule or talk about God's anointed people. The truth is, is you need the Spirit and you may be ridiculing uh, someone that has something you need. Um, and those of you that have been teased or made fun of or ridiculed, whatever the case may be, be encouraged. Don't let someone else, come on, rob you, come on, of the gift that God has given you. Um, I have constantly been teased for the anointing that is on my life. Uh, it is amazing to me. But what I, I realized that darkness or in some cases just walk in ignorance because they do not know. The scriptures even talk about kings um, wanting to experience what we the church have experienced you have an opportunity to get filled with the holy spirit and the only one stopping you from getting filled with the holy spirit is you because it is a promise by god it is for all of us doesn't matter you can't use any you can't say well i'm a woman and you know it's a man's world you can't say i'm black you know i'm brown come on and, and come on it's a white man's world you can't use that excuse because god doesn't care you can't say i'm too old you can't say i'm too young you can't say i don't have any education that's no excuse for getting filled with the holy spirit oh hallelujah oh hallelujah oh hallelujah you can't allow any lie or excuse to stop you or keeping you from getting filled with the holy spirit the only person stopping you from getting filled with the holy spirit is you and the th question i would ask god is, Lord, what am I doing wrong? What is it that I haven't dealt with? What, have, what is it unresolved issue in my life? Why have you not filled me completely with your spirit, your anointing? And of course, there are some. We can't keep blaming the devil for what God has already uh, won. A victory he's already won. We can't keep blaming the devil for, come on, a victory God has already claimed. Amen, brother pastor. Amen. I wanted to give an offering on that one. Amen. Okay, so, um, so Peter quotes the prophet Joel that the Holy Spirit has come upon all of us without distinction. I love this. And so it goes, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. You know, some churches, unfortunately, won't let women get into the pulpit. There's one scripture um, that they base this on. And I think sometimes it's just uh, insecurity of certain men. Just maybe they feel, uh, they feel like they're doing the right thing. But I believe sometimes it's just the insecurity of people when they see the spirit of God upon a person. It doesn't matter if you're a male or female. That's not the issue. The issue is your heart. The issue is, are you available? The issue is, are you willing to be used of God? That's the real issue. The issue has nothing to do with your gender. And so even though these men, God will open up a door. God will make a way. No man can hold back God from, from uh, using his vessel the way he desires to use them. He goes on, young men shall see vision. An old man shall dream dreams. I haven't had a lot of big dreams lately, so I'm, I'm guessing I'm still young. 
<laughs> Don't laugh too hard at that one, some of you, especially you, Azim. <laughs> Amen. And he goes on and he says, and all my maid, men servants and all my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, says the Lord, and, uh, and they shall do what they shall prophesy. So he, Jesus was even speaking to the slaves of that time. He was even speaking to people that were being held back, that he would still meet them, come on, where they are. And all my men servants, some of my men, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. Here's another thing, too. Here's another, I think, a wonderful nugget of understanding the word of God, learning the word of God, that the last days began when Jesus came to the earth. The last days literally began when Jesus was born on the earth. And he says what? And the last days will end when Jesus returns for the church, when the rapture comes. After the rapture, then comes the seven years of tribulation. So if you think about it, what we have been in the last days for over 2,000 years, and that's the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was considered what the birth or the dispensation of the church. And so I want you to think about this for a minute. You have been born in the greatest time in witness of God, the church, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. A lot of times we like to look at these churches that don't have the Holy Spirit. Or we like to look at these churches just as an organization or a 5013C. Um, we like to look at them, how big the building is, how wonderful they're, but, but we don't look at whether they are literally, whether the spirit of God or the presence of God is there. Doesn't matter how big the place is, doesn't matter how much money um, they funneled into uh, to present such a wonderful looking building or organization, or, or actually even doing my, a lot of works without the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, without the Holy Spirit, come on, in any church, regardless how big or small, um, they are not really representing God. God is a spirit, and those that worship him should worship him in spirit and in truth. And it's amazing how some people can turn their nose up at uh, certain churches because maybe they're in different neighborhoods or, or maybe they, they're not as large as their church and people have a tendency to tickle me as, as if God is going to give more kudos to someone who has more versus to someone who does not. God, God doesn't love that way. God loves all his people the same way. So anyway, so here's Peter and he's quoting, he's quoting Joel and he's still going on. And he says, verse 19 says, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vipers of smoke. And the sun shall turn into darkness and the moon into blood before the, of this, the coming of the great awesome day of the Lord. Now he switches from the last days to the time of judgment. He goes from the last days into the seven years of tribulation because we just went through uh, revelations. And this is what takes place in the time of the seven years of tribulations. And so he's talking about what God is getting ready to do. Amen. He goes on. And, and I, I titled this the salvation of all men, all mankind. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So here's Peter again. Remember, he's quoting Joel. He's quoting a prophecy uh, that was over a thousand years ago. He's quoting it in the outpouring of the spirit. This is the day of Pentecost. The spirit of God is coming. People are speaking in tongues. God has come. They had, Jesus has, has been on the earth after the resurrection for 40 years. He ascended into heaven. He gave his apostles, come on, their charge. They're in the upper room and they're praying. The Bible says they were all on one accord. And then suddenly a sound came from heaven. Suddenly there was a mighty wind stirring. And what? And then the spirit of God came out and people started speaking in all these different languages. And you got to remember, this was the Passover time. So there were thousands of people in Jerusalem at that time. And so as they, as they, they, they saw and heard all this commotion taking place, they said, these people are drunk. He said, Peter said, these people are not drunk. It's nine o'clock in the morning. But then he goes on to talk about what the prophecy of Joel. And I love it. He said, it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's 
talking about Jesus, who is what? The head of the church. And so here's Peter, his first sermon. You know, Peter did a lot of messed up things. But come on, but Peter was available. You know, Peter was the one that told the Lord, I never leave you. I never forsake you. And Jesus turned to him and said, before the, the crow croaks, uh, excuse me, before the rooster crows three times, you shall deny me three times. Before the rooster crows, you shall deny me three times. That's what, Peter, that's what he said to him. And Peter ran off and Peter denied the Lord three times and even cursed is to say, I don't know him. I don't want to be with him because he did not want to be crucified with Jesus. He was afraid and scared. And so here's Peter. And his, this is his sermon. He goes on in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested, approved by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst. As you yourself also know, I love that. Peter is now declaring Christ. He's got the boldness of the Holy Spirit. He's filled with God's spirit. The power of God is upon him. And he's preaching and declaring Jesus as Lord. You know, that's one thing that the Holy Spirit will do. The Holy Spirit will declare Jesus as Lord. Amen. I love this because this is the Living Words uh, translation. And it says, but God, following his prearranged plan, lets you use the Roman government to nail him to the cross and murder him. Then God released him from the horrors of death and brought him back to life again, for death could not keep this man within its grips. The King James Version says, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Oh, man, this is, again, the Apostle Peter. This is his sermon. He's preaching. There's no script in front of him. He doesn't have any three points to his sermon. <laughs> it's all Holy Spirit. And he's doing what? He's speaking. God is speaking uh, through him to, to the people. And then he goes on. Again, we're still talking about Peter and his preaching. He said the words of the King David. And this is, now he's beginning ready to say uh, or quote, he's already quoted Joel. Now he's getting ready to quote some things from King David. Verse 25, but David said concerning him. So when he says David, he's talking about who? King David. For I thought that was the first anointed king of Israel. Remember there was Saul. Saul was not really considered, come on, God's choice. Saul was the people's choice. But David was a man after God's own heart. Come on, you remember David who slayed Goliath, the little boy with a slingshot? He grew up to be the king, the first anointed, appointed king. Come on, by God. And so David said concerning who? Him, Jesus. I foresaw the Lord, who? Jesus, always before my face. For he is what? At my right hand, that I might not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is rejoicing, my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. What was he talking about? So God had given King David a revelation of Jesus being raised from the dead, a revelation of hell and heaven. And he was saying, the, the Lord spoke to me and he told me, come on, that I wouldn't go to hell and I would not what, be left there. My soul would not be there. And he went on to say that, that even Jesus, come on, he would, he would not go to hell or would his soul or his body what, uh, suffer corruption. In other words, uh, God's body, this, this body that we're in, it would not what, decay. And so David is speaking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he's giving an account. Come on. So David says, so again, Peter's doing what? He's quoting the Old Testament. That's amazing. You know, the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, but in the right place with the right revelation added to it. And then, of course, here we go, Acts chapter 2, verses 27, the Living Bible. You will not leave your soul in hell, nor your body of the Holy Son decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. I love that. 
<laughs> King David. This is still, we're still quoting King David. I'm just going to a different translation. He says, you have made known to me the ways of life. You have made me, what, full of joy in your presence. The ways of life, full of joy in the presence of God. You have made known to me. You know, people like to try to live life without God. They want the, it's interesting. People think that give me the information you know, even to the point sometimes where we want the application, but we want it without God. <laughs> you know, don't get me wrong. Do you need the application? Yeah. Do you need the information? Yes, you do. But is it to be without God? Or are we, are we, are we so wrapped up in what we want to try to achieve and do in life that God just, just give me the money, I'll, I'll handle the rest. You know, just give me the blessings I can have. Just give me the information. Give me the applications. Come on, I don't need you. And, and that's kind of what we do. We think that, come on, if we, if we could just get the wisdom, that the wisdom is all we need. And David is saying, you've made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. In other words, Outside of your presence, there is nothing. It was David who said, Lord, take not thy anointing away from me. You know, David, King David, the same King David had did what he had killed Uriah, the, the wife uh, or the husband of uh, Bathsheba. I mean, a man he had, had created a, a situation where he had an adulterous affair with a man's wife, then made sure that the man was dead. He got her pregnant, then made sure that the, the man was dead so that he could, could cover up his sin. And then he finally came to God and repented and said, and he said, Lord, I was born in iniquity. You know, forgive me. You can take everything, but please don't take your presence from me. Most important thing, David understood the ways of life is to walk in the presence of God. My, uh, <laughs> my granddaughter broke her phone, you know, the little glass part on top of it. She was just crying. I mean, Pastor Carol just looking, you know, like, okay, sweetheart, you know, it's, it's just a telephone. And, that, and I had to have sit down and have a talk with her and just let her know, you know, she's a kid. You know, they don't know any better. I had to let her know, this, none of this stuff means anything. None of it means anything. Most important thing is you. Don't value anything that much where it, where it holds you. Cars, homes, come on, money. Don't value anything that much where it grabs your emotions so much so that you think, come on, you can't live without it. And so I had to have my little talk, but just like, just like us, she has to grow up and go through the growing pains just like the rest of us. And so again, he's quoting um, King David. And so the apostle Peter, he continues to, to talk. Verse 29, he goes on and he says what? Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriot David, talking about King David, uh, that he is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a, what, a prophet and knowing that God has shown with an oath, excuse me, sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would rise up the Christ and sit on his throne. For seeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Simply just repeating what he'd already said. So we understand that King David was also a prophet and God was giving him revelation and understanding of the resurrection, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some people have made a whole doctrine out of this and you hear um, things that Jesus went to hell and preached and people were freed. And, um, I've done some studies on it. I, I don't find that uh, doesn't ring true according to scripture with me, but there are some, there's some, uh, I guess some, 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 some good things and some bad things about it, but it, it's hard if Jesus died on the cross, if he said it is finished, because um, some religions believe there's a, a place where people are held, um, until um, until judgment and they're judged there. 
the Bible clearly says that every man uh, shall die once and then judgment. In other words, there will be what they call a great white throne. Everybody, all of us, come on, we'll get judged together. So how did Jesus could go and preach to the old saints before the cross when he says that everybody will be judged at the same time? When that time comes, the great, we just talked about the, the great uh, day of the Lord. That is the time when God will judge everyone, the dead and the living. There's only going to be one call for everybody uh, for judgment, according to scripture. That's why we have to learn uh, the scriptures. Okay, let's go on. We're still in the same. He's still preachers. He's still preaching. This is his message. He's still preaching. This Jesus, God has risen, come on, raised up of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he said himself, and Lord said to, excuse me, but he said himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. And so David did not ascend into the heavens, but he said himself, there you go. That's right. That's how I go. But he said himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So we're talking about Jesus doing what? Uh, the son coming to sit at the right hand of the father. So after his work was done, after Jesus died on the cross and the last words of the seven uh, last saints was, uh, it is finished. The Bible says, come on, that he was what? Buried in the tomb for three days and on the third day he rose and God rose up that body. And if you remember the scriptures, uh, Mary and uh, some of the ladies, they saw him, they were getting ready to touch him. He said, no, wait a minute, hold on. I, I have not been glorified by the Father. In other words, Jesus had to take up the blood to the, the heavenly um, temple and pour the blood um, in the holies of holies so that everybody's sin, come on, was paid for. The past, the present, and future sins were all paid for. There was one more thing he had to do. And then, of course, the Bible says that then he sit at the right hand of the father because now he's what at the charge. And, and God said something so interesting that I want us to go over. And I hope we have enough time. And let me see if it's the next scripture. Yeah, here it is. He says 35. He says, do this. He says, till I make your enemies your footstool. And so God, the father, after Jesus Christ being the sacrifice has given Jesus authority and power. He says, and sit at my right hand. In other words, rule with me until I make all of your enemies. Come on, until I do what? Make them your footstool. Now, it, it was common that the victors in those times would put their feet on the necks of the, of the kings and other governors and the leaders of their time. In other words, so when, when Jesus had this, this, when Peter's preaching this language, or when Jesus, uh, and, or God in his word says this, they understood exactly what that meant. You know, I can imagine being a king of a nation and then being defeated by another nation, and then the king of that nation takes his foot and put it on my neck. How humiliating. But, but to say that that king is now defeated. Um, if you go back to Genesis, it's amazing because after Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, there is a part in there where God, he sentences Eve to have birth with pain. He sentences Adam to tilt the ground by the sweat of his brow. But then he sentences the Satan, the snake, and he says, you've bitten his heel, but he's going to crush your head. What was he saying? He was talking even in Genesis how God, come on, was going to crush the enemy's head, put his foot on the neck of the enemy and declare that I am king. And so I thought it would be really good to just kind of put this in here um, and to make sure that we understood who the enemies of Christ are. Well, without doubt, we would say the devil. Of course, the devil the, is the enemy of all. I mean, I mean that's an easy one, right? The Ephesians tell us what chapter 6, verses 10 and 11 says, Finally, my brethren, be what? Strong in the Lord and the power of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of who? The devil. Number one enemy of Christ and you. Come on, and I is the devil. Well, let's, let's talk about him just a little bit. So who is the devil? He's the antichrist. He is so against Jesus. Anything, he's against resurrection. He's against peace. He's against love. He's against the church. Come on, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he's against you. Come on. He's the father of lies. Because, you know, Satan didn't mind you, come on, in the world sinning. He just never wants you to get saved. And then when you get saved, he doesn't want you to live right. And I love this because a lot of people don't understand his role. He's a liar. He hates Jesus Christ. And the only reason he hates you is because of Christ. That's it. There's no other reason for him to hate you. But when you belong to Jesus, he hates you. And he's against you. He's the father of lies. So he's what? He's, he's a manipulative of lies. He's going to lie and keep you in the dark as much as he wants to keep you from truth. Because truth, the truth of God's word is power for the, child, for the child of God. It's power for us. The more word you know, come on, and that you can operate in, come on, that you can obey and keep the promises of God, the more powerful you become. He's a tempter. So he's going to use your weaknesses against you. He's going to continue to bring stuff to you to do what? To bring you out of God's will. He's always, come on, if your weakness is food, he's going to bring food to you. If your weakness is the, the opposite of sex, he's going to bring the opposite of sex. If your weakness is money, whatever your, if your weakness is pride, come on, you know, you've got to be right. He's going to bring the situation always. He's always going to place something in front of you so that you can continue to do what? Fall. Oh, he's the prince of darkness. If I can just keep you ignorant. Keep you in the dark. And we know he's a serpent. He's a snake. I don't need to, I don't need to elaborate on that. He's, he's wicked and he's what? He's the evil one. Same scripture, Ephesians chapter six goes on. But we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Until when, when, when Peter says, that he makes this statement. <laughs> Let me go back up. And when Peter makes this statement, till I make your enemies your footstool, you need to understand the power or the clarity or the broadness of what Peter was saying. Come on, let's go back. He's saying quite a bit. He was saying that that church, Jesus Christ is Lord, but there's still a war. He has an enemy, and you need to know. And you've been in darkness for so long. You've been in darkness, not really, you know, understanding that there's a devil, never having power over him. And he's always trying to do what? Keep you in a place where you're going to do what? Where you're going to fall into your sinful areas. And the truth is, is we all have sin, and we all have weaknesses. doesn't matter who you are. So anyway, let's go on. So principalities are dominions or territories in the form of a city state, country, or nation ruled by a principality of darkness. When people, when they talk about people don't realize principalities is a dominion. A principality can be in a school. It can be a principality, it can be in a house. A principality is just a, a, a spirit that wants to rule a situation from the, from the authority down. A principality can use anyone. It's a ruler of darkness. And also, I love this because it's also, he, he said, of uh, this age. Notice, let me go back. He says here, rulers of darkness of this age. Now, you got to understand something. That was, that was 2,000 years ago. This is a different age. And God, Satan, is so slick that he has, come on, he has uh, rulers of darkness for every dispensation of time. He's not going to use the same stuff he used in their time. He's going to use different things, what, for the time they were in. There's a, this is a different dispensation. And so he uses different tools. Spiritual hosts of wickedness. The word host simply means what? Army. And so Satan has an army, which consists of what? Soldiers that are what? Commanded by what? Leaders, generals, majors, you name it. You, you've seen the army. We have a Navy. We have what, the Marines. We have the Army. Come on, we have the Air Force. It's an army. 
And what do we do? We have dominion, come on, over the United States. <laughs> and we protect these lands, take this army away, and guess what happens? Someone else, come on, will try to do what, have dominion over you. And so we are, we are the army of the Lord. Come on. And so now when our body becomes the temple of the Holy Ghost, come on, God now has dominion, come on, in our lives. And he uses us as soldiers against evil. But the first evil we must get rid of is the evil inside of us. And so he goes on, he says, in heavenly places, simply meaning what? Uh, places of authority. And so, amen. So that's devil, Satan. That's the, that's the guy. He's got an army. His name is De he's, he's the devil. He's got an army. And um, they ruled dominions, um, places, um, times. He has an army, and he's got people in places of authority. You can look at some of the states. Uh, you can go to the White House and see the dominion of evil. I mean, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's just a lot of wrong doing in high places. And it's obvious. It's not even, they're not even in the dark anymore. They're not even hiding anymore. They're just doing it out right out there. They're not doing right. They don't care. And so again, strongholds, arguments in your life. Here's another enemy, but the enemy is not the devil this time. The enemy of Christ this time is the strongholds and the arguments that we have in our own lives. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. Those strongholds actually exist in us. And when we come to Christ, those strongholds are already there. And, and we can't get rid of those strongholds until we do what? Grow up or we're willing to face, come on, these areas and these strongholds in our own personal life. That's an enemy of God. That's an enemy of the cross. He says, casting down arguments. Why is it such a stronghold? Because it's an argument against the truth. It's an argument against God's word. He said, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I'm amazed at the people that think they know better than God. I'm amazed. And bring every thought into captivity into the obedience of Christ. You don't have to receive every Christ, excuse me, every thought. But the truth is, if you don't have any words of God, come on, to combat your thoughts, you will always have a stronghold. And then he says, being ready to punish all disobedience when obedience is what? When it's fulfilled. Yeah, that's the, the enemy of Christ as well the strongholds within us some strongholds come on they come up they come up with fasting and praying some some strongholds come on you have to go get some counseling you know we want it to be instant but but i'm gonna tell you something about a stronghold strongholds didn't come instant and they don't leave instantly a stronghold is like a the word stronghold actually is a military term and it's it's when a fortress a castle has been barricaded and no one can get in and nothing can get out. It's a stronghold. It's so fortified. And, and think about that. If your mindset is so fortified, no one can convince you of the truth. That's a stronghold. I'm not going to change. I don't care what the word of God says. I'm not going to believe. I don't care what the preacher says. I don't care what the word of God says. This is what I believe. And this is what I'm, and, and it's amazing the things that, well, come on, that, that we lie to ourselves. It's an argument. He needs to cast that argument down. Come on, against every high thing that exalts against the knowledge of God. And there are just certain things that we believe. But that's a stronghold. And that's something, that's something, that's a battle that you need to do with from within, and they're not instant. Second Timothy chapter three, verses one and two. This is from the Passion Bible. But you need to be aware that in the final days, the culture of society will become extremely aggressive and difficult for the people of God. People will be self-centered, lovers of themselves, 
obsessed with money. They will boast of great things as they shun around them in their ignorant pride and mock all that is right. Um, they will ignore their own families. They will be ungrateful and unholy. He's saying that, that in the last days, in the final days, that's, that's what the scripture is from. This is the passion um, version of it. That in the last days, this is what happens. And I love it. They just kind of gave a little bit more uh, explanation to this, this last day part. He goes on in the King James Version, New King James Version, traitors, heart, uh, headstrong, hearty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having, here we go, look, 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 look. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power, denying the Holy Spirit, denying the word of God, denying the resurrection, denying the miracles, denying the power of God, deny, denying, deny does not exist. That was that was tongues for back then, miracles for back then. That denying all denying the word of God, the word denying, oh man wrote that Bible, denying the things of God, having the form. Oh, but I'm a good person. Oh, but I denying, come on. Jesus rose from the dead, denying that the father, denying creation, denying, denying a man and a woman. Come on, deny, deny, deny. And from such people turn away. Be why? Because this is the enemy of Christ. Atheists that hate the very idea of God are the enemies of God. Here's another scripture, and this one comes from the New Living Translation. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often before, I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many who conduct and show that they are already really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are uh, headed for destruction. They're God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things and they, th and they think alone about this life here on earth, excuse me, and they think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely. Now I'm, go I'm going back to Peter's sermon. He said, after he talks about um, Jesus putting his feet on the neck of his enemy. He says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely this God has made that this Jesus whom was crucified both Lord and Christ. Now, when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart and said, to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? First sermon, one of the things that always needs to be understood, the word of God is a tool to get to the heart of the matter. It cuts to the heart. It gets to the real issues of life. You know, it's a lot of fluffy stuff going on that really, things that don't really mean that much. Um, <laughs> we have a lot of fluff in church, but the word, it cuts, it gets to the real issues. I love it. If he, excuse me, Hebrews chapter four, verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of the soul and the spirit and the joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. See, this is why the word of God is so, so important. If you don't let the word of God do its operation on you, 
You'll never be well. You'll always have strongholds. You'll always be in the dark. The enemy will always have a dominion over you because it is the word. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. It is. It was there for our healing. It is there to get to the heart of the matter. It is what it is our weapon against the enemy. Come on, it is the, it is the weapon that brings down the strongholds and the wrong thinking in our life. That's why we're supposed to but renew the, our minds. That's why scriptures, I believe it's Romans 12, 1 and 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What is the renewing of your mind? The word of God. So important. First sermon, first sermon, Peter is preaching. And all of these nuggets are in this one sermon. And so Peter says to them, what he says, what shall we do? Then Peter says, repent. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. People like to talk about the Holy Spirit, and get them, but the truth is a lot of people are not getting filled with the Holy Spirit because they don't know how to repent. It's, it's, you just don't turn away from the bad. You turn to God. It's one thing. All of us have done something wrong. All of us fall short of the glory of God. All of sin have fallen short of the glory of God. But what happens to people is they want to they want to get away. They say, well, I changed my mind about that. But you're not turning to God. you got to turn to God to what? His Lordship. That's how you get filled with the Holy Spirit. you got to let him. Well, I don't want this happening in my life. You want to have a better life? And hey, great. That's good. That's wonderful. You're having a great life? Wonderful. Guess what? But you still need to turn to God. You still, have, you still need to let him be Lord. Come on, and master. And you still need to obey and do what he says do. And that's what he said, be baptized what? It didn't say be baptized in your name. It didn't say be baptized in your opinion or your ideas. It said be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. What? Our Lord for the remission. He's the one that paid. He's the one, oh, hallelujah, responsible for your salvation. Oh, hallelujah, it's his blood that will cleanse and wash your sins away. Oh, hallelujah, oh, hallelujah. Turn away from your sin. Turn away from that which is wrong, but then turn to Jesus, who is what? The lover, come on, the author and the finisher of our faith. Then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The name of Jesus is such a powerful name. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Those in heaven and those on earth and those what are in hell underneath them. Those every knee shall bow. The truth is, is come on, you're going to bow. The question is, is <laughs> what condition are you going to be in? What position are you going to be in when you bow? But you're going to bow. And every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of, of God the Father. We're all going to bow one day. It's called the great white throne of Christ. It's in the book of Revelations. And one day God is going to give an account. He wants every man is going to give an account for every word they're spoken. They're going to give an account for their life. Oh, be careful what you talk about. Oh, I repent. every. If I have a bad thought. Oh, Lord, I'm just stay on, try to stay on top of it. Cleanse me. Wash me. And so here again, back to Peter. Peter's still preaching. But this promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call. Man, what a, what a message. What a message. Peter was saying something. We got a couple more minutes. Almost done. And with many other words, he testified and exalted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Uh, then those who gladly received his words were baptized that day. About 3,000 souls were added to them, perverse generation. And what does that word mean? It, it means that which is twisted or turned from the proper direction. I like that definition. In other words, come on. Are we, do we need to be saved from the generation around us? Come on, if that generation was messed up and they were going the wrong way, 
What about this generation that we're in? And this word is often used um, of the eyes when one or both are turned from their natural positions. And so he's saying, be saved. One of the things that tickles me about mankind, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk, and I hope you guys, I want you to hear this in the right spirit. But one of the things that tickles me about mankind is how easy we are to follow the crowd. It is amazing to me how we jump on, but we just wanna be a part of what everybody else is doing, what everybody else is talking about. And, and I, I'm just amazed at how people jump in and they just want to be a part of the crowd. And they don't care. They want, we're like uh, comedians, uh, chameleons. We want to, to blend in to everything. Um, you know, as a Christian, you're going against the grain. You can't do everything the world does. That's what that word means. Peter talks about, he's talking about the, the separation. This great cry of Peter, save yourselves from this untoward, uh, problematic, troublesome, corrupted generation. Save yourself. The word, the word save yourself means that a person is what? To act and to do exactly what Peter preaches. Repent and be baptized the warning to the righteous to separate themselves from the unrighteous. And then I love this one because I'll never forget God telling me to give up my friends. Second Corinthians chapter six, 16 says what? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are what the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. There's some things, come on, some of you, you need to give up. It's one thing if you're new and you're learning about this, because it's new. But look at Peter. Well, look at Apostle Paul to the Church of Corinthians. There was stuff they still weren't giving up. They were trying to have both. They were trying to live in both worlds. And it wasn't, they weren't new Christians. They had been around for a while. And the apostle Paul had to, to minister this to them. Come out from among them and be separated, says the Lord. And do not touch that which is unclean. One more scripture and just close it out. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Man, what a mouthful. That's Peter's sermon. And, uh, and the Bible goes on to say 3,000 people joined the church. That, that was the birth. That was the outpouring. A lot of times we skip over this sermon and we talk about, and then we want to talk about all the wonderful things that the Holy Spirit does. But you know what? It took the Holy Spirit and Peter, come on, to get the people to repent to where they could receive the Holy Spirit. Because the word of God had to cut it had to cut to the heart, but it was a cut of love. It wasn't a cut like I'm downing you. I'm down. You're no good. You know, God's going to do this. You're going to go to hell. No, no, no. It was a cut to the truth. Things they needed to hear at that time that God loves them. Come on. But we crucified him. He died for you, but we crucified him. And uh, they heard him. And now remember, there were, I think it's estimated almost a million people in Jerusalem during the Passover. 3,000 got saved that day. So there were a lot of people that didn't, didn't get saved. Okay, let's do this. Let's pray. Father, once again, uh, we thank you for your witness your witness of what Peter preached. Thank you for allowing us to, to have this time together. 
I pray, oh God, that the word cuts to our heart, that something was said today, that we also must say, what must we do? I pray for those, oh God, that have maybe um, some challenges and they're repenting, but they need to turn to you. Let them know, oh God, that's, that's what it's about. You need to turn, turn to me. Turn to me, says the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. And I will help you. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I will deliver you. Hallelujah. I will heal you and I will show you the way. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And surrender. Humble yourselves. That's what, that's what he wants. To the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. To the God of all. To the God of the creation. Turn to me, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Fill us again, O oh God, and again, and again, and again. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen, amen. Okay, let's stop sharing, and then um, let's take some time, and let's talk.